Are you able to tell like, how many people are on? Do we have people in? Not yet. Looks <laughs> like you got time, right? Pardon? Oh, that's me. That's me. Oh, that's you. Okay. Yeah, it's before from here, this. Well, from here, you get a little bit of a yeah. 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 I look a lot it's better. I'm a lot better looking when the picture is much smaller <laughs> like that. When you agree, <laughs> I resemble everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, never mind. All right. So, um, well, I'm glad that uh, those of us who are here are able to be here this morning. I was just getting the lowdown. I guess we've got uh, some COVID homebodies this morning. Uh, they either confirmed have it or they were with somebody that was confirmed have it, so they're quarantining. So uh, we certainly understand that. Uh, but I'm glad that everyone is able to be here this morning. Um, can we um, can we remember the word that we started on last? Justification. Uh, <laughs> oh, right on. Good. Somebody was paying attention. I appreciate that. That was week before. What's that? I was going to say reconciliation, but that was week before. Well, that's a good memory, except for the fact that it wasn't the week before. Well, it was Two weeks. a month. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, yeah, so of course, our study for the next uh, through the end of July is Words to Live By, where we are examining uh, Bible words. And Troy, where's Troy, by the way? Oh, no. Yeah, because he's, I always call them churchy words, right? Because those are words that we use in church. He was right when he said, you know, I prefer to call them Bible words. I'm like, okay, Troy, you got it. That's right. That is really right. The reason they're churchy words is because we find them in the Bible. That's the order. There is a little bit of a negative connotation of that. To churchy? You want to say you can church. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. We hear that we can kind of be a complaint uh, or a diss, right? When someone says, "Oh, you're being too churchy," but it doesn't happen very often. Say, "Well, you're quoting the Bible too much, aren't you?" you know? Right. <laughs> kind of a little different thing, isn't it? Um, so today, though, we are uh, we're going to finish up our study on the word justification. So we did start with reconciliation uh, last month when I had a one-off opportunity to teach. And um, so again, justification, some of these words that we're going to be looking at, uh, sanctification, propitiation. So there, in some cases, can be kind of big words, right? And, and um, words that we may or may not like actually know the definition of. We know them in the context of a Bible verse or something like that. But to our objective here is not only to better define the words, right, which I think is an important starting place. You have to understand the actual definition of the word, especially in the context, right, the Bible context, the, the God context, the cultural context uh, of Judaism, the cultural context. We're actually going to look at a passage this morning we're starting uh, before Judaism became a thing, right? And so understanding the context for the usage of these words is absolutely critical to being able to understand the definition and not only the definition, but the way the spirit is using the words within the context of the passage, right? Whatever events or parables or letters or whatever is going on. So um, quick recap then, what do we, does anybody remember the definition that we came up with last week for justification? We looked at a couple from like the Oxford Dictionary, um, and maybe Webster.com, and then we went to our Greek, um, um, inter, not inter, uh, lexicon, I lost the word for a second. Uh, Thayer's our Greek lexicon, so we can get the definition within a Bible context. Anybody remember what's the definition of justification? I got justification is by faith and only for the ungodly. Okay, that's yes. So we did cover that last week. The definition, though, is within that that context. Justification is only for the ungodly. All right, and it is by faith. I've got that it's the uh, an act of God whereby humankind, that being us. Is made or accounted just or free from guilt or penalty of sin. That's right. That's the, that's the working definition, right? So, it, it and that's why it's only for the ungodly, right? Because godly people don't need righteousness. They already have it, right? They don't need to be given. They don't need to be justified. 
because in their minds, they're already righteous, right? And we're going to look at a couple of occasions of that this morning, uh, I th hopefully to help kind of better implant that part of it, the fact that it is only for ungodly people. So, um, yeah, the, the act of God, which is really important, justification is the act of God giving his righteousness to us, accrediting, imputing, right? And so let's start, if you have your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 15. This is chapter 15. And uh, we're going to look specifically at verse 6. You can see I've got the verses up here on the screen if you're uh, writing this down. By the way, uh, Richard, after I did that reconciliation class a few weeks ago, Richard had mentioned about maybe getting these. Uh, and I, I spaced it. I talked to Jim last week about it briefly, and then it's like, phew, I forgot about it again. Uh, would it help you guys, or would you want to get copies of these PowerPoint slides yes. with the notes and scriptures and all that? Yes. Okay, so we'll figure out, Jim, if you'll help me to just figure out how to get that, because, sure. yeah, um, and we, whether we can send it out, you know, a couple of days ahead of time or something like that. So uh, that we'll have all the references. Okay, so Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Somebody have that here to read it? Go ahead. Uh, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited him to righteousness. Okay, Abraham believed. That's pretty simple, pretty short, straightforward scripture, isn't it? Statement, Abraham believed God and he credited it to him as righteousness. So what we see here, and that, that passage, by the way, is cited or quoted referenced several times but in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to look at at least one of the occasions in the New Testament here. That's our Galatians reference in just a minute. So does anybody know the context of this statement in Genesis 15? Anyone? Bueller? It had to do with uh, Abraham's being childless. Being what? Being childless. Child yes, yes, yes. Okay. So um, yeah, and he even, the ver few verses right after that, he even talks about how Abraham knew that in his body, right, and, and he was 75 years old, we get all that. So the context here, in Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses, um, we have God giving to Abraham, actually Abram at this point, in 15, he's still Abram. Um, in, in Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses, God gives to Abram, a promise. He promises to Abram that um, you go to where the land that I'm going to show you, everywhere you put your feet, I'm going to give you this land, right? Um, and not only that, I am going to make your descendants, he's saying this to a childless man who is 75 years old, he says, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as numerous as, he says in another place, as the sands on the seashore. And he, again, he's saying this to a man who is 75 years old with no offspring, right? And so when we get to Genesis 15 and verse 6, and it says that Abram believed God, we have to understand the, the, the depth of the belief that he had, that the fact that of course, he knew that he had he was childless, right? I mean, that's not a secret. So he understood that, and yet he he trusted in the word of the Lord that when God says he's going to do a thing, when God says he's going to make Abram descendants of some sort, he didn't. I mean, he couldn't have possibly conceived that he was actually going to have his own offspring, right? At least not initially. But he still believed that somehow, some way, God was going to fulfill his promise to create a great nation. And he finishes up that promise by saying, all the nations of the earth will be blessed in you. So now, this is before the law of Moses. This is before Israel became a nation. Right before Israel was ever born, Israel being, of course, Jacob, who had his name changed, right? 
And so, I mean, this wasn't even on the radar. This wasn't part of it. It was on God's radar. It wasn't on anybody else's radar. So the fact that that this incredible promise was given to him that not only would Abram become a great nation, but he was going to have many, you know, as many descendants, more descendants than he could possibly count. And through all of that, that the nations of the earth will be blessed in him. So when we get to, the, by the way, in Genesis 15, it's kind of a retelling, a restatement of that promise that God made in Genesis 12. So Abram's actually questioning him. How am I going to know that this is actually going to happen, right? And you can read through that and see how God answers him. And in following verse 6, we see that there is this covenant, that, that the God cuts a covenant with Abram at this point as um, some kind of evidence, if you will, uh, to Abram. But before he did that, before he actually made this covenant, we learned that Abram had already believed. He had already trusted. He already had faith in God. And that's why when we get to this spot, when it says Abraham believed God, God understands. He recognizes his faith. And he says, as a result of your faith, I, God, am making you, Abram, righteous. Okay? That's what's going on here. And the, if, you, if you are unfamiliar, um, at least on a deeper level, it, it, I mean, we're all familiar. We all know Father Abraham had many sons, right? Many sons had father, right? We know that from our childhood. Um, but if you're unfamiliar, beginning in chapter 12 with the promise and uh, really up through chapter 22, the, the restating of this, and I think it's maybe chapter 28 where he states, God restates to um, Isaac the same promise, and then he restates it again later to, um, to Jacob, all right? So this promise is a big deal. And it's not only a big deal for them, it is still a big deal for us today because we are recipients of the promise. We are part of the nations who have been blessed because of the faith of Abraham, right? So we are playing, we are part of this story. We're part of this narrative. We are part of the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abram. What is that? 4,000 years ago is when this promise was made. And we today, us sitting here now in this room, are recipients. We are participants in a 4,000-year-old promise of God to Abraham. That's pretty cool, right? And it all revolves around God giving his own righteousness to first Abram, and subsequently through all that to us. So we sit here now with our faith in God and God looks down on us collectively as a group here in this room and each one of us individually as he, as he evaluates our hearts. And he says, Jenny, righteous. David, righteous. Irvin, righteous. Jim, righteous every single one of us and it's because of our faith in christ that he has given us that credit okay so <laughs> Larry, I mean, when I my version in new american standard says he reckoned it to him as righteousness i so much prefer the word credited we love credits on our statements <laughs> yes <laughs> that if you think about it, what a beautiful picture that is that that's credited to our account yeah that's and that's a good point you know Reckon, when I use the word reckon these days, it's like, well, I reckon I'm going to go up to the store here in a minute, you know, something like that. And so it's more of a slang. But, um, yeah, to be reckoned, I think credited, it's easier for us to understand, right? We get that. To be credit paints the picture. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it, the thing is, is it's not like a credit. How do you say this? If we, if we have on our, our charge card... Um, we have a, a, we make a purchase or maybe we don't make a purchase, right? But a charge appears on our account that isn't ours. We call the credit card company, the bank, whoever it is, and we say, hey, this isn't ours. Say, oh, sorry about that. I'll credit it to your account, right? 
And so we think of it, and it is a ledger thing, right? It's really a, an accounting type of a statement, if you will. Um, and that's what justice is all about. Um, I, when we started this last week, you know, some of the affiliated words or related words, one of them was justice. The word justice very simply means to set things right, right? We think about our justice system. The justice system in its pure form, right? The way that it's supposed to work. And we could all take pot shots at how it doesn't work, right? That's not the point. Although it would be fun, right? <laughs> um, to set things right, the justice system is supposed to take um, someone who has been offended, right? Violated in some way and take the perpetrator of that offense. And somehow that's what the scales of justice are supposed to represent that you know, right now the balance is this way in favor of the bad. The justice system is supposed to bring it back so that it's equal, right? So there is no good and bad, things are just on the level. And so when we think about crediting, we normally think about um, an offense maybe that has been made against us. And I think this is really where it gets cool. And, and maybe to your point, Richard, is that this crediting is not something that was against us. It's something that we did against God. And yet he's the one that gives the credit back to us, right? So it's, it's, it's credit kind of flipped on its ear, isn't it, mm -hmm. right? And which makes it all the more beautiful. The fact that he is giving us credit for something that we really don't deserve, right? I mean, that's really the essence of it. It is a credit when we don't deserve the credit. Okay, so let's, now that we've seen this, we've identified, then he believed the Lord and he reckoned, I used it in ASB as well, right? And we'll say credited, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now go to Galatians chapter three. And if you're familiar with the Galatian letter, Paul, uh, Paul is writing this letter to a group of churches. Uh, Galatia, as opposed to like Philippi and Corinth and Thessaloniki, and the, these are individual cities, right? Galatia is an entire region, and there are multiple churches within this region, and that's, that's the group to whom this letter was written. And the problem is, and the reason he had to write this letter was because there were uh, Judaizers, which are a group of Jews who had come from Jerusalem. They had gone up into the Galatian region, and they were, Judaizers were those who were saying, yes, Jesus, plus circumcision. Okay, that's the whole issue. Yes, Jesus, plus you must follow the law of Moses. That's, in, in essence, what they were trying to do there. David. Didn't they also basically say you have to be a Jew, you have to become a Hebrew first, and then you can become a Christian? That was a big part of it, yeah. And that's what made them Jews, Judaizers, was that they, it was all about the law of Moses. They had... Christianity tied directly to Judaism, okay? So whether or not they were forcing conversions or even among Gentiles, because in Galatia, there were certainly a number of Jews. You can tell by the language that Paul uses in the Galatian letter that he's speaking, he's using Jewish language, right? Um, that language that revolves around the law and things like that. Um, but uh, there were a lot of Gentiles in the Galatian region as well. So you had these Jews who were trying to force upon the Gentiles and even the, the Jews who had genuine faith, those Judaizers from Jerusalem were coming up and saying, yes, Jesus plus the law of Moses. Okay. So that's what's going on in the Galatian letter. And if you read through it, why he said, Paul uses the harshest language in, of any of his letters in this letter. When he says, oh, you foolish Galatians. I mean, he's calling them out. He's calling them names almost, right? He's like, you know, you want to come up and grab them by the, the collar and go, what are you doing, right? That's kind of what he's doing here. And he's saying, don't you understand that, that you were saved by faith and it had nothing to do with the law of Moses? Are you now going to go back? And, and try to bring in the law? You think the law is what's gonna save you? Okay, so that's part of what's going on here. So he, he references back to the Genesis 15 exchange and record that they have as Jews. So we're in, in Galatians chapter three and beginning in verse six. 
you know what? Let me just start up in one because that's the that's the foolish reference. Um, so in, in chapter three, verse one, it says, "You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified?" This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Listen, that's what he's saying, right? Listen, the only thing I want to know. Answer me this one question. Did you receive the Spirit by works of law or by hearing with faith? When they answer, when we when we have the answer to that question, we understand whether or not someone is justified or not. Did you receive the Spirit because of your Judaism, because of your circumcision, because of your following the law and keeping the Sabbath and all these things? Is that how you got the Spirit of God? Or did you get the Spirit because of your faith in Jesus? Answer that question, okay? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are now being perfected by the flesh, the flesh being the, the following of the law? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? All right, so then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Is Paul driving this point home? Man, he is banging this drum, isn't he? All right, so then we get to verse 6, and this is he says, Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure, have confidence— Paul's saying, listen up, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel. That's an interesting use of that phrase, isn't it, in this context? The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. So anything jump off the page here for anybody or, or any, any points that you can see that are really, really important here? Well, the differentiation between faith and the works of the law. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, for us, the works of the law are kind of a no-brainer as being just that. They're old stuff. They're, they're old stuff. But faith, that's kind of that's kind of where it's all at. It's our belief that God will justify us. Yes. Yeah. It, essentially, it's our belief that God is going to do what He said He was going to do. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's what it boils down to. And and what I would say is it. For, and you're right, because it's easy for us to say, well, that's the works of the law, Old Testament stuff. It's easy for, we're not Jews, right? So it's easy for us to discard that. Um, but what's not so easy is that while he's talking about the works of the law, um, he goes on, and if you read through the rest of chapter three, and really I would encourage you to read the Galatian letter just over and over and over again, because it's fantastic. Um, not that there are any bad books in the Bible, right? You, I mean, you get it. But um, uh, the Gentile, as Gentiles, we don't have the law. We don't have the law of Moses. What we do have is law of our own creation, right? And so what I would say to you is that it doesn't matter whether it's the law of Moses or other laws that we have kind of created ourselves, whether they've been written. I mean, most of them aren't written down necessarily, but we can create our own laws, and then we use that as Gentiles where the Jews were using it, the law of Moses. And we create a set of laws and say, yes, faith in Christ plus this, 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 that, right? And if, yes, you have faith in Christ, that's, that's really important, guys, right? Have faith. But you've also got to do these other things. And when you do these other things along with Jesus, then you're saved. That is just as damning. You understand? It is just as condemning for us if we create our own laws and say belief in Jesus plus whatever it is we put on there. Okay? So just as condemning. David? Yeah, I wanted to say um, this is, I think, the strongest place. Well, well, he doesn't quite say the words, but it's the strongest case 
that all Christians are the chosen people. Yes. Okay. Um, it's not a matter of genetics. It's not a matter of being able to trace my my male you know, lineage back to the to Abraham. Right. Okay. Um, I trace my faith back to God. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will say, however, it's also there's a, an interesting wrinkle here, though. If you really think about it, it also says, okay, so the law of of Abraham, no, the wisdom in the Old Testament, yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah. we are still sons, if you will, of Abraham, right? Yeah. So all of that's still there. It's not. That's one of the things that bothers me, and I know we don't do that in this in this body here. But you go to a lot of churches, and all oh, the Old Testament, you know, well, that's right. that, that's not us, you know. I'm like, right. um, yeah, you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is really when it gets into um, where it can start getting difficult to to try to reconcile, like James's approach to works, right? When we read through, especially the first at chapter two. Um, and James, I mean, he's really direct. He says, faith without works is dead, right? It's useless. So how do you reconcile that and what we're reading here, right? And what we looked at last week and how, you know, works, we, we saw in Romans that it's not works, right? It's, it's not the righteous who are justified. It's the ungodly who are justified. So, um, so let's, I just realized what time it is and holy cow, this has gone quickly. Um, <laughs> So we haven't even gotten off the first slide yet, you know, as far as our, our reference, scripture references. Somebody's talking too much. And that's exactly who it is. So what we can see from here is that uh, in our key scriptures, right? Abraham believed God, God justified him. Pretty straightforward, right? I probably didn't need to talk as much as I did for 30 minutes to get to this point. Abraham believed God and God just, God credited him as being righteous. God gave to Abraham his own righteousness. Okay, so guess what? Us being sons of Abraham, we believe, and God justifies us. It is really that simple. Now, we all know simple doesn't always translate to easy, right? I get that, but we don't need to start from a place of confusion. Let's start from a place of clarity. And the clarity is, is that our faith in God is what God has said to us. We have this faith and I give you my own righteousness. Beautiful. Every one of us sitting here I had a conversation this week, um, just earlier this week, with a, a friend of ours. She was a member of the church in Montana where I used to minister. She has a 21-year-old son, and um, there is he, he's try, struggling, trying to understand what it means to be saved, to have a relationship with God. It's stuff that we've all been through. I've been through this. We all have, right? How do I know if I'm good enough? Right? You ever asked yourself that question? How do I know if I'm good enough? And, and really, we might say, the problem is, is I know that I'm not good enough, right. <laughs> right? I mean, that's an easy answer. I know that I'm not good enough. And because I know that I'm not good enough, I'm worried that I'm not saved. I'm worried that God is going to condemn me. And what we miss when we do this, when we, when we hang on that worry, is we miss the promise of God. And that's where it just needs, a, our faith needs to be strengthened. Our faith needs to be bolstered. And so that when we come to things like this and we can see how absolutely simple it really is. And, the, and maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's because it seems too simple. And because I have been so bad in my life. I mean, right? That's what we think. I, there's no way that God could possibly save me if God only knew the things that I'd done, right? Oh, what do you mean if God only knew, right? God knows the things that you've done. God knows, listen, God knows the deepest, darkest 
secrets, the deepest, darkest thoughts that you have ever had, God knows them. And in spite of that, God says, you are righteous. And I don't know of a more beautiful story in all of the world than that right there. Amen. Right? That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right? And that's what we learn here. And, and just like Irvin, that's in verse 8 when he says, The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So justification and this righteousness that, that is imputed to us is an integral part of the good news of the kingdom of God, right? So when we're talking to people and trying to help them see what, what's this Jesus thing all about, we need to be sure and tell them that, uh, you know, all that nasty stuff, all those really bad thoughts that you've had and the bad things you've done, right? Yeah, you believe in God and he wipes all that stuff clean. He wipes the slate clean because he is now giving you the righteousness of Christ. He's giving that to you. Man, if that's not good news, I don't know what is. Amen. Right? Okay. Uh, who just had their hand up? I was just perfect. I just, just wanted to say that it's amazing how the faith was emphasized even in the Old Testament. Yeah, you bet. With God promising this to Abraham that he would have nations, yeah. his descendants, his nation. He finally got that one child, and then God asked him to sacrifice him. Yeah. And he was going to do it. Yes, he was. With the faith that God would raise him up again. That's right. If, if he did. And that is a lesson to us, regardless of what things look like in this life. Yeah. It's that trust and that faith in God that keeps us going one step after the other. Yeah, that's right. It, it, there's no way that Abraham expected that God was going to tangle a ram up in the bushes up there, right? He didn't know that was coming. And he did know that God had the power to resurrect yeah. the dead. And the whole world is caught up on belief. Yes, I believe, but the Bible tells us the devil believes and trembles. But yeah. the, the belief we should have is like an old bumper sticker that used to go around. If you were on trial as a Christian, uh, for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Right. And so you need to live it. Raised from baptism and walking in newness of life. That's right. And that's where, when we start getting into that, and even into that, the, the James' use in, the, in, um, in James chapter 2, um, that's what sanctification is all about. That's what being made holy. And that's, we're going to get into that uh, here over the next few weeks. But um, so let's, um, we're going to have to blow through these next, uh, I've got two passages in Luke that I just wanted us to look at uh, as a little bit of a, well, a, a contrast of sorts. Um, is it 10? So Luke chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. This is leading into a passage. We all know the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Right? A man was wandering. He's beaten <clears throat> and left on the side of the road. A Levite comes by. A priest comes by. They both walk by him. And then a Samaritan uh, comes by and aids him and so forth, right? What led to that story, what led to Jesus telling that parable, however, was a lawyer testing him. And that's what we see in 10, um, uh, 25. Lawyer stood up, put him in the test. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, uh, is that a question we all ask ourselves? Right, that's what the same, that's the equivalent of what the people in Acts 2 said when they said, what must we do to be saved, right? What shall we do when Peter preaches that sermon and he convicts them, right? You are the ones who put Jesus Christ to death. But God has raised him from the dead and God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. They were pierced to the heart and they said, brethren, what shall we do? They're asking the same question this lawyer was asking. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? The difference is motivation. Right? We know that the lawyer was asking the question to test Jesus. We know the people in Acts 2 were asking the question because they were convicted. Right? 
So motivation is at the heart of all of it. We all know people who can, who can quote scriptures really, really well, but who have a blackness in their heart. We know some people like that, don't we? All right. So this lawyer now testing Jesus says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What is, uh, Jesus says, what does the law say? And then what's the lawyer's response? We all know this. What is it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love, love the, the Lord, Lord your God. God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your mind and soul, and your strength with all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Where's the lawyer quoting? Or from what's he quoting? Deuteronomy. Yeah, he's quoting from the law, isn't he? Right? He knows the law. <laughs> And he says, what, what does the law say, Jesus? <laughs> what does the law say? Love God, love your neighbors. And what does Jesus say to that? He says, yeah, you've answered correctly. Just go and do that. Go and do exactly what the answer is that you gave to me. Look at the next statement, right? So now we are in, um, so verse 28, Luke chapter 10, verse 28 says, uh, Jesus answered, says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. That was his question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, do this, life. Bang. Look at 29. You talk about a sad statement. But wishing to justify himself. He asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And it is out of that motivation that Jesus tells a story of the Good Samaritan. And of course, we all know how it ends when he says, um, when Jesus asked him, who is the man's neighbor? And he says, the one who showed him mercy. Go and again, same answer he had before. Yeah, that's the right answer. Go and do this, right? Go and do likewise and so forth. So <clears throat> here's what we learn. Look, having the right answer mm -hmm. is a good start. But having the right answer does not equal justification. Knowing the right answers does not equal salvation. Knowing the right answers does not equal relationship with God. Okay? Again, we know people who know the right answers, but who do not know God. And it's a sad place. Um, the source of the lawyer's justification, we just pointed that out, right? He was wishing to justify himself. And then, so let's look at this other one in Luke chapter 18, and then we're going to do this really quickly because I've got some, uh, some takeaways for us that I want to go over. We'll just have to kind of hit them as highlights, but um, Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. Somebody gets there, please read that. Some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. All right, what do we notice about that statement? What translation is that? NIV. NIV. Um, yeah, just read it one more time, Jane. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Okay. Self-confidence. Self-confidence. They're placing their belief. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, so the New American Standard says, and he told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Same thing, right? Again, what's the source? They're looking to themselves um, as righteous. And then, okay. We spend a lot of time trying to justify ourselves. Yes. And not enough trying to let, let God justify. Yeah, that's right. And the thing is, it's so much less work if we just let God do his thing. Right? Exactly. It is so much less. It's, it's such an easier life for us if we will just do what God has said, which is believe in me, right? And I'm talking specifically about working for salvation, right? I'm not talking about that we just sit back and don't work. And that's to, to Irvin's point earlier, right? Okay. So um, this is really important as well. Justification and contempt of others are in conflict, God's justification we're talking about, right? They are in conflict. So um, it is, we cannot look down on others if we truly understand what God has done for us. 
if we truly understand the righteousness that he has given to us, because, you know, we're not righteous like Jesus, and yet he has forgiven us, and yet we'll look at other people, right? So embrace this, that God's righteousness and conflict or contempt with others, they are in conflict. That's what I want to say. Uh, we get legalism defined, uh, and we just don't have time to go into that, but basically it's that we're looking to ourselves uh, for justification based on the works that we're doing, the things that we're doing. I'm doing these, all these things right, and as a result of me doing all these things right, God basically owes me, right? And that, that's what legalism is. Um, and this is interesting in verse 11. To whom was the Pharisee praying? Look at verse 11. Oh. Yeah, he's praying to himself, right? And then if you look through the prayer that he actually utters, it's, um, all right, and then we see which of the two was justified down in 14. It says the one who, who prayed, you know, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Jesus says he's the one who will be justified. All right, this is one of my favorite passages um, in Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 21 specifically, where he says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That's atonement, by the way. Another one of the words that we'll look at. To be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All right? Anytime you see the word so that, um, you can, you know, underline, highlight, whatever you do, because that is a purpose statement. Whatever is about to follow that is a purpose statement. So why did God, or why did Jesus do what he did on the cross? He did it so that you and I could become the righteousness of God. That's the purpose for what Jesus did, right? Okay. Um, there we go. This is important, this last bullet here. Justification allows a, for a change in, in relationship status. All right, so let's get to these. Um, what does it all mean? All right, I've got 10 of these. We're just going to hit them bang, 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 okay? Um, God justifies us by declaring and making us righteous. Our justification must influence how we view others, right? This goes back to that having contempt for others that we can't have. Uh, God treats us as if we had already paid our penalty, when we know in reality, it wasn't us that paid the penalty at all, right? It was Jesus, and that's the atonement, how that factors in. This is interesting, too, that justification is not a change in our inner character. That's where sanctification comes in. That's what it means to be made holy, right? That's inner character. Justification has to do with a change in our status before God. We're either righteous or we're unrighteous. When we're justified, God says you're righteous. That's the status change. And the only real basis for justifying sinners is God's own righteousness credited to the sinner's account. Uh, Christ's death on the cross satisfied the penalty that justice demands. Because when their crime has been committed, some kind of penalty has to be paid, right? The ground for our justification is the cross, and the means of our justification is our faith. Uh, it solves the problem of the sinner's guilt. We tend to focus on the penalty, don't we? Like, like heaven and hell. That's, it, it, it's one or the other, right? That's the penalty or the reward. But we don't often talk about the guilt that comes along with it. So justification actually solves the problem of the guilt that we might carry around as well. And this is the, what we talked about last week. Justification is not for righteous people. Right? And why is that? Because in, in a righteous person's mind, they're righteous in their own mind. They're already righteous and do not need to be given any more credit of being righteous. Right? So that's why, and I know this statement may trip some people up, uh, but we learned it right out of Romans 4 last week, didn't we? That God justifies ungodly people. Okay? Um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Class is <laughs> Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs>
great job. Thank you. I must thank you so much for the credit. We are.